Hi, my name is Tammy Lee Meyer, and I'm an advocate for social and economic change. Uh, today I'm joined by Arthur Brock. Arthur Brock is a leading innovator in terms of currency and uh, currency solutions, and he's uh, an amazing human being uh, that comes to this work in an open source way. Uh, and I would love for you to share a little bit of an overview as to what you're building, Arthur. Thanks, Tammy. <clears throat> it's good to be here. Um, I, I'm with the MetaCurrency Project, and we have a, kind of a, a grand vision about building the tools for the next economy, for the kind of the post-industrial age economy. Um, and that includes post-monetary economies, which people get a little confused about, but, you know, baby steps. We're not jumping all the way there all at once. Um, and in particular, there's a platform that we're working on to enable these things that we call Scepter, which is short for Receptor, um, because um, a big part of the design for us came out of a breakthrough about receptive capacities, a way to have these computing systems not be brittle and um, to be able to talk with each other, to be able to interface with each other in, in very powerful ways. Um, and then in particular, the stage that we're working on right now, Scepter has a lot of subparts. It's a really big project. It's kind of like rebuilding our whole computing stack and internet in some ways, right? Um, but in particular, the thing that we're focused on right now is Holochain, which is our blockchain alternative for um, building distributed applications. It, it provides data integrity for distributed applications. Um, and it's a completely different architecture than blockchain. We've kind of inverted a whole bunch of parts of it, uh, in particular to get around a lot of the consensus bottlenecks that are present in the blockchain architecture and to focus instead on, the, on, on agency and autonomy. Um, so the blockchain essentially needs to have uh, a bunch of different nodes uh, make sure that truth is happening, right? And so that takes a lot of machine power. So how is, how is Scepter different, different from that? Well, the, the blockchain approach, um, basically, yeah, everybody, you're trying to get everybody to agree on consensus. And consensus in a, in a decentralized system can be tricky. Um, and so the strategy is you actually bundle a bunch of changes or in the case of, of the currency transactions um, into a block of those changes and commit big chunks of them at once and, and commit those to a chain. That's why it's called a block chain. There's a block that may have hundreds of th transactions or thousands of transactions and, in it. And um, what people think is happening is that all of these machines are trying to agree about everything. But what's really happening with proof of stake and proof of work type algorithms is that every node, every miner on the network or whatever, they have a different view of reality. They've received the messages in a different order and they are trying to um, commit their view of reality as the reality, the accepted reality for everyone. And there's basically a lottery, which is this, you know, um, a, a, a contest that's, that's done with proof of work of basically trying to do this brute force cracking of a, of a cryptographic hash to be able to commit the next block. And that's what sort of gives you the authority to commit the next block. And then everybody validates that the block you just committed is, is follows the rules, the shared rules. But it, it's really this strange lottery about whose vantage point we're going to accept as the official vantage point for this window of time. And um, with Holochain, we've inverted this whole thing and we've basically said, instead of even trying to design for this absolutist perspective as if there's one true reality that we have to manage consensus on, what we're, we're doing instead is managing the integrity and provenance of data from every place that it comes. Right. Um, 
So each node has its own chain of its own changes. They're, you're the only one that can write to your node and you, I mean, to your chain, and you only write transactions that you're having or you know, data that you're changing to your chain. Um, and then you share it to a distributed hash table, which is already a fairly well known and designed architecture with not a lot of bottlenecks in it for being able to get data out into a shared space and not everybody has to hold everything. Like that's one of the other things about blockchain is that, you know, you've got this Bitcoin's blockchain is what, 120 gigabytes now or something. I mean, it's, it's growing rapidly and it's huge and takes a long time to synchronize and, you know, um, you don't have, everybody doesn't have to hold everything. Yes. But can I give an example of like, yes, please. Think about it? Think about it like, um, imagine if Wikipedia, instead of being centrally hosted on servers, if everybody who used it decided to just carry the burden together of Wikipedia and host the equivalent of, you know, six to 10 pages, but it's really maybe more, it's not pages. It's like the page sections. You'd, you'd probably break the app up into the page sections and serve those out so that you can get them from a bunch of sources at once when you're building a page. Um, and so you're not holding very much of Wikipedia and that, that gives you hundreds, probably thousands of um, duplicate copies, you know, redundant copies online at any time. And uh, you just service a very small part of the traffic and the storage. Um, and everybody kind of carries that load together. Yes. So it's truly distributed. It's uh, truly distributed. In every, a, peer, yeah. every peer is an equivalent peer. Yes. Yeah. But it allows, allows a small group of people to be able to um, update, keep those updates and authenticate them. Yeah, the way that, that instead of consensus, the way data is validated on Holochain is that it is a validating DHT, a val validating distributed hash table, so that when you commit something to your chain and then you share it to the DHT, before any node that is supposed to be serving that out um, is in a neighborhood where that piece of data is going to live, um, before they can accept that data, they have to validate it. So they actually send a message back to the source, to the author of that chain, and make sure that it's signed by them, that it's committed to their chain, that it's, you know, and potentially more things. Like if you were doing something not Wikipedia, if you were doing a currency, for example, then there'd be other validation rules where you're, you're actually checking their, their, that they have the money they're spending. You're checking their account balance, you know, um, and you may have to, audit their whole chain to do that. Yes. So maybe we can do a quick uh, check on what, what's the problem this is looking to solve. Um, we are trying to enable new patterns of social coherence and of governance and of um, sharing power by sharing information. Yes. Um, because if you think about it, at this point, in many ways, software kind of runs the world, world, right? Like, and software is just information. It's just an architecture for sharing information. But true to the success strategies of the industrial age economy, most of our computing architectures are centralized. And we have historically collapsed data integrity with data access. Like we're going to hide the data inside of a firewall and really control who has access to it and all that kind of thing. Cause that's the only way to make sure that it doesn't get altered. Yes. That's not true anymore. Yes. You know, we now with cryptographic hashing and with signing and with, um, with other methods, uh, um, you can make structures, data structures, chains and trees, hash chains and hash trees that are um, essentially tamper proof right? You, you can't uh, change them without disrupting the whole pattern, the whole architecture. And so you can make tamper-proof data and be able to share it in new ways, which means new forms of, of governance, new forms of collaboration and cooperation. I mean, if you think about a lot of the game-changing internet businesses, right? 
they have not been doing anything but putting software in the middle of value that everybody else creates. Right. Right. So Wikipedia is an example of that. eBay is an example of that. You know, Facebook and Twitter and, you know, we can go Airbnb and Uber and we can go on and on and on. There's all of these things that are just tapping into the value that everybody else is bringing to the party. Yeah. By putting their software in the middle, they're getting to suck all the money out of everybody for, for putting themselves in the middle. But what if you didn't have to put a corporation in the middle? Yes. What if you could actually operate this as a, as a commons, you know, in a new, in a new uh, social and governance pattern as well. Yes. Um, and, you know, I think it's not just these changes afoot in business, but in government, like people are starting to really question how broken is this thing we've got going on here and starting to look to alternatives. And I think this is where you find some of those alternatives and people are looking to blockchain for that kind of stuff. And that's not what blockchain's designed for. Yes. Um, it's, you know, token centric. It's based on crypto tokens and it's not based on agents and accountability. It was designed for anonymity. And, you know, it's like the, the, the fundamental architecture was designed for managing cryptographic tokens as monetary units, you know, not for building social coherence. And you see all kinds of breakdowns in the, in the crypto community because of that, like, you know, battles about which version of software is going to come into play to scale Bitcoin. Are we going to change the block size, you know, or the, the Dow hub, you know, disaster and the Ethereum hard fork and, you know, all of, all of these attempts at trying to um, use, trying to deal with social coherence in a world, you know, in an architecture that doesn't, doesn't provide that. So let's talk a little bit about trust because a lot of this is based on trust. And uh, I guess I would also look at um, data and when the world woke up in 2009, 2010, realizing that data was in fact an incredibly important uh, piece uh, and global governments and global bodies uh, really started to look at that and have moved into that space without, without checks and balances. Uh, and so, yeah, let's talk about trust. Well, one of the things that's interesting is that all these crypto tools, like um, all these currencies, they claim to be trustless currencies, you know, and, and by that they mean that there isn't that centralized third party in the middle, that Facebook in the middle of your posts or the government in the middle of the money which people pretend the government is in the middle of the money, but it's really the banks in most countries, not the government, that people are confused about that. Um, and uh, so instead, what you're putting your trust in is basically math, is cryptography, is you know the idea that we can build a system that can um, maintain its structural integrity and we don't have to rely on essentially, you know, who has the biggest army right. to do that? Yeah. You know, what, when, it, when it comes down to it, we, we, we pretend that there's trust there, but in a, in a lot of ways, it's oh. kind of backed by force, by threat of violence, not by trust. And um, because of that persistent threat of violence, we sort of trust that the system will kind of keep working that people don't want to deal with the consequences of messing with it too badly and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but that's not necessarily the healthiest pattern, <laughs> one we want to be stuck in. Absolutely. So in terms of one of the things that I deeply respect about your approach and uh, your focus is that uh, you're looking at decentralized, open source, open governance, and kind of looking really at uh, uh, beyond what we're what we're looking at, but the machine underneath, and how do we design that machine in such a way uh, that we can inform the the development on top of that to yeah. be something that can be trusted, and because it's it's built on something that is open, decentralized, and we've 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 modeled that machine language around it. Right. Yeah. I mean, we have taken. 
I, I wanted to use the language great pains, but in, in many ways it was actually great joy um, in modeling our architecture on nature. Yes. You know, in really looking at how do living systems scale? How do ecosystems scale? How do bodies scale? How, you know, like bodies, we've got trillions of cells without a boss cell, yeah. you know, and uh, how is it that these things actually build their patterns in to the system, right? So every cell carries the same set of instructions. They carry the same DNA. And then they specialize from there, right? But they choose, they, 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 they have a certain kind of autonomy. Most people like to sort of simplify cells and think that, well, cells don't have any choice in the matter. They don't have, you know. And it's sort of weird to, to even talk about free will in the, at the level of cells or whatever, but it would seem that cells have um, variations or options. You know, some cells go rogue and become cancerous and, you know, not all cells do their job. You know, it's not, it's not the only choice, <laughs> um, but it tends to work out better for them if they follow those instructions right that's a that's a sort of a, a, a the guardrails for you know collaboration yes and um but it's a fairly resilient system to some of them misbehaving um but not too many of them you know <laughs> right and we can all see it so yeah uh, let's go to status of uh the the holochain maybe let's do a little bit of an overview as to the holochain because we've touched on it um but yeah, yeah. let's dive in well, um, we broke out the Holochain as a separate sub-project from Scepter um, basically at the beginning of January uh, and just started jamming on coding it. And we had a, our first hackathon for building applications on Holochain in March and um, learned a lot from that process. A lot of people were really excited about it. Some people came who'd built smart contracts in Ethereum and that kind of stuff. And um, we got a lot of good feedback actually about how, how easy it is to build things on, on Holochain and how kind of much more relaxing it is in that um, you could uh, release things in controlled ways and not ha immediately have massive Irre irrevocable risk, you know, monetary risk by putting something out on a smart contract out onto Ethereum. You know, if you have mistakes in there and people exploit those mistakes, you're kind of screwed. It's, it's, you know, the whole point is that it's kind of written in stone. It becomes self-governing. It doesn't, it, it's not easy to change. Now you can have some rules about changing things in smart contracts as well, but those tend to take high levels of agreement that are, that are difficult to, attain. So for the uninitiated, what is the Holochain? Uh, Holochain is a, a strange blending of um, signed hash chains and a distributed hash table to operate as a kind of distributed database, actually a graph database and uh, in a validating um, distributed hash table. So it, it's, it's some weird variants on things that are already proven. I mean, like you can run different versions of Bitcoin software, but in the end you will have to run Bitcoin core as the validation rules, or you risk um, forking your reality off into a space that others won't accept your blocks. Right? So this whole thing of that you, everything has to pass the same validation rules that's already built into to blockchain. And that's a little bit distinct from consensus. And we use it quite distinct from consensus. We use it to validate every entry on the DHT. And so distributed hash table, distributed hash table. Exactly. And, um, you know, distributed hash tables are, are well, proven out there. Most people know of like BitTorrent or some of the file sharing systems. That's a, that these, these are architectures that are already, you know, have years into use and optimization. Um, and 
So yeah. would, it, would it be correct to say that it is a distributed hash table that facilitates a currency-like process that can trigger smart contracts? No, okay. Nope. Let's dive in there. So um, smart contracts, like if we look at, at Ethereum, for example, smart contracts run in the Ethereum virtual machine. They're basically a script or program type of thing that runs in the um, Ethereum virtual machine, which is which actually spreads the computation out over the, the blockchain so that the computational steps can be inspected and um, not controlled by any one individual. Um, and the what, what we do is um, Holochain gives you a virtual machine type of environment as well, um, a nucleus, yes. where you can write programs. Um, so far we have two different languages you can write programs in, Lisp, you can write a, you can use a Lisp nucleus, a Lisp, a Lisp VM essentially, and JavaScript. Um, we have somebody that may be working on a Ruby one, so maybe releasing a, a Ruby one soon. And in any case, you basically write a program there that deals with the defining the data structures and the processes and the validation rules. And then every node runs that same code. So the hash of that code for people who, who you know, you can, you can do this um, cryptographic hashing <laughs> on data, right? That's part of how distributed hash tables work and everything is that you take the, you run a chunk of data through a hash algorithm and that becomes the address of the, of the data that's stored, where it's stored. Well, we run the, the DNA of your application, the app code through a hashing algorithm that becomes the Genesis block um, of your or the Genesis entry, because we don't do blocks, um, the Genesis entry of your hash chain. And for every node joining this holochain, they would have that same Genesis entry, but that is, um, that should come out to the same hash. And that's part of what shows you're running the same code, the same set of agreements. Okay. Um, and uh, then the next Genesis entry, there's actually for us two Genesis entries, is your identity stuff where you put your public and private keys and any identity tokens um, that you want on that next chain. And so everybody's changes, chains start identically in the first entry and the second entry, they all diverge, right? They all have a different chain because they all have a different identity. Right. And then these things are shared out to the, to the DHT uh, as, the, as the shared database essentially okay. for the data. So what might someone use this for? Well, Holochain right now comes at, with sample apps with a distributed Twitter and a distributed Slack, um, just as example apps, you know. So, um, and they're, they were pretty easy to write. Like, it's not a difficult thing to write these things. So the kinds of things you could use this for is anytime you need to do um, shared space data creation, maybe a Facebook type thing, a social media type thing, uh, um, Wikipedia type thing, um, shared assets, shared um, like, like, you know, Uber and Airbnb and all those kinds of things where you want to have everybody be able to kind of follow the same rules in creating a way to, to participate together. You could use it also for, um, for running, uh, organizations and for creating, you know, shares of, of participation or stock or, you know, those, those types of things. Um, one of the interesting things about it is because you always commit to your chain and then to the, to the DHT, it follows um, good self-publishing practices like posse, you know, publish on self and syndicate elsewhere. Have you ever heard of, heard no, of that? No, I haven't, but I love it. Yeah. So so it means that whenever you're operating in a group group context, like Wikipedia, for example, you would always have copies of anything you wrote. So in Wikipedia, you know, that the group could never take away the things you've created because you have and hold a copy of that. And it also, so one of the big power dynamics that shift is this tension between the group and the individual. 
Yes. And, you know, a lot of our politics polarize around the role of individual versus group and the powers between them and who can, you know, enforce what and, you know, that kind of thing. And this creates a new kind of mutual sovereignty yeah. where the indivi- where individuals can fork off into a new version of the software, you know, and say, we want to go this direction. And anybody who wants to go that direction can switch to a new set of rules and fork the chain and take their things with and, you know, take their marbles and go play another game. And the group can't stop them from doing that. Right. The only thing that the group can do is say, when you're playing in our context, you're playing by these rules and yeah. everybody has to play by the same rules. They're literally hashed to, to make sure that they're the same rules. So there's an ele- there's a strong element of sovereignty. Yes. Uh, data and personal. Yeah. That's fantastic. So where are you now and what do you need? Well, one of the interesting things is we have been undergoing a significant shift. This has been a, people who have known about the Metacurrency Project, it's been a long-term, one of those big, hairy, audacious projects that people, you know, wonder if it will ever happen with, with good cause. Um, and uh, we have been accelerating hugely. And actually this last week, we just got in some funding. We pe- have been being approached by, by funders. And so that's ramping us up to new levels of um, organizational capacity. So we've really been transforming this from kind of an open source tech hobbyist project to uh, um, a going business concern. And um, yeah, so we, but the project is accelerating, go, growing rapidly. We are about to release um, an alpha version of Holochain. Um, when we finish this milestone with security checks, we, 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 we built this sort of sprinting to that first hackathon to enable app builders. And we skipped some parts of making sure that security was implemented everywhere. And, you know, but we don't want to actually release it until we can vouch for that. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got a lot of fun, fun tools coming out built on Holochain, like distributed public key management and, you know, things like that. Great. And when's the release? Um, it's going to be sometime this summer. Uh, I, we were hoping for mid-June, but um, we actually didn't get into the security pass milestone tickets until last week, basically. And so um, it's going to take longer than two weeks. So it's probably going to be more like July. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah. So and is, is, there any, is there any help that you need? Yeah, well, we need lots of help with communications, with um, development, uh, with the sort of telling the story. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is also in building our own infrastructure, our own business infrastructure, we're building a template for other organizations that want to be able to run themselves as a um, decentralized organization that lives in software, you know, like a a sovereign accountable commons is what we call it. Um, but uh, we're building that infrastructure and, and want to be able to empower other groups to use it to launch their organizations as well. Yes. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. But so other things we need, we have um, a residency program happening this summer. We're going to have two work pods, one in San Francisco and one in Albuquerque. Um, the one in Albuquerque is going to be geeky techie programmer, folks. The one in San Francisco is going to be like communications, media, storytelling, blogging, maybe a crowdfunding campaign for the commons engine we're building. Great. Fantastic. Oh, that's exciting. And so you're looking for people who might want to participate. Yes. And um, just one note about that. We operate as a duocracy. Um, And uh, that means we empower people to do stuff. Um, and if you want to step up and there's something that you want to do, you can actually do that. Um, you don't really need to wait for permission and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, if you go to, we, we, if you search metacurrency, duocracy, or something like that, Scepter Holochain, um, you'll, you'll find that we have um, 
information about this whole thing. And we have different teams that are, that are called do-ops. Um, oh my gosh, that's wonderful. <laughs> that are self-organized and you can create a team to do what, what you know you want or if there's one that exists you can jump jump on and find out you know when they're meeting and what their communication structures are and there's basically the one requirement of monthly coordination with the whole so that we know what's what's going on fantastic great well that's exciting i'm really i'm really grateful for you to make the time to come and talk today and to share what you're up to it is fantastic and that's yeah. Yeah, I'm really excited to see the the steam rolling on and uh that you're joined by a bunch of doers. Yeah. To make yeah, it it's really It's been great. Good. Our team's really been growing and we have great people that are really excited. So <laughs> Okay, well, I'm looking forward to doing more of these more of these pieces with the project and thanks so much for your time today, Arthur. Thank you. <laughs>